The latest unemployment figures crept up to 4.1%. Is that good or bad? Well, in today's Property Insider video, Dr. Andrew Wilson and I unpack what's happening to our labour markets, and you may be surprised when you dig deeper into the figures. We also have a talk about the latest home loan figures, which show that our housing markets are going to be strong in the spring season, considering how many people are taking out home loans already. And there's a particularly strong segment of investors getting back into the market. We explain all this in our show today. If you want to keep up to date with what's happening in our housing markets, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and click the little bell icon so we can let you know each time a new show comes out. The Reserve Bank's trying to quell inflation by raising interest rates in the hope that we spend less and also to slow business growth to in turn lift unemployment so wages growth moderates. The latest employment figures came out last week showing employment rising by a pumping 58,200 jobs in July to a new record high that 14 million 14.4 million Australians are working. In fact, over the last three months, the economy has added more than 150,000 employed persons. That's a remarkably high number. To me, it looks like an almost Goldilocks set of numbers, strong jobs growth, but gradually in easing in the unemployment rate. However, I'd like to get the views of Australia's leading housing economist, Dr. Andrew Wilson, chief economist of my housing market on these figures. And I'd also like to get his thoughts on the latest home loan statistics. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, g'day, Michael. And um, I, I sort of agree with you quite 100% that uh, these were good numbers. Unemployment rate up from 4.1% to 4.2% um, over July, uh, I guess, in terms of the headline rate. It's like, oh, well, that's a higher unemployment rate. But as you said, when we and, and maybe that's not good news, but when uh, we look at the underlying data, it is an extraordinary labour market at the moment. Um, very strong labour market. And the point is that we have, um, you know, a rise in the unemployment rate, which is a, a statistical measure. Um, it's probably what the Reserve Bank is looking for to some degree, because it means that there is uh, now a little bit more competition amongst workers out there for um, for jobs that are available. And, and that means that uh, there's not that same pressure on employers to have to bid for more workers by putting up wages. And of course, if that's not accompanied by productivity growth, the way that employers will cover those higher wage costs is through higher prices, and that means higher inflation. And we don't want that, that's for sure, and particularly the RBA. So they'd be pretty happy with those numbers. But in terms of the performance of the economy. It's just, again, remarkable. 58,000 jobs created uh, over uh, July. It follows a 50,000 rise over June. You mentioned um, the growth over the past three months, Michael. Let me add to that. This year, Australia has added uh, well over 300,000 jobs that have been created. So 300,000 extra jobs, and yet our unemployed have increased by around 60,000. So, uh, you know, we're creating jobs at an unprecedented rate, really, um, given, you know, we've got this massive surge in migration. So we're able to absorb the uh, the surge in migration um, without, you know, really creating any under or, or certainly any sharp increase in the unemployment rates. It shows that, you know, businesses are still employing and the extraordinary thing about this, and this it sort of accounts for the higher unemployment rate, is we have now a record high participation rate. So even though we are getting all these people coming into Australia and obviously looking for work, we're absorbing them now uh, and our participation rate. And that, of course, measures the proportion of the workforce, and that's people uh, over the age of 15 um, that are actually in work. It's now at 67.1%, which is an all-time high so these are very, very strong numbers, Michael. And, and that 300,000 plus jobs created so far this year is uh, really, again, reinforcing just how strong this economy is. And as I said, some good news, bad news there in terms of um, a higher unemployment rate, yes, um, but still low. And in fact, the unemployment rate, Michael, is still around about where it was during our big mining booms in the early 2000s. Uh, and in 2011 to 2012. So, uh, uh, but of course, there's a lot of agenda 
Uh, a lot of agenda setting out there in terms of the usual doom and gloom, suggesting that this is not a good, uh, not, that our economy is declining at some level, but it's not. It's still very, very strong, given those higher uh, interest rates and that surge in migration. Well, the Reserve Bank obviously takes unemployment figures into account when deciding what's going, what they're going to do with interest rates. Have they come out to say anything about this? Well, the, the Reserve Bank has a dual brief, Michael. It's to keep inflation within the target range and they use underlying inflation as the measure. That's between 2 and 3%. The Reserve Bank has said that it needs to see some consistency within that range and they would be looking for a, the mid-range between 2 and 3%, so 2.5%. And that, but that, but Michelle Bullock has said quite clearly that, that they need to see a sustained period where um, the inflation rate is uh, is in that target range, the middle of that target range. Um, and they've also said that, you know, and as we discussed last week, they've said that, um, you know, they're looking quite clearly at the quarterly data um, to determine interest rate outcomes, policy outcomes. Uh, now, the next quarterly data set for inflation is the September quarter. That won't come out, Michael, till October. So that would have to be pretty severe, I would suggest, uh, in terms of a decline, to be even considering an interest rate cut, which some fewer now are suggesting would happen in November. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, the Reserve Bank has quite clearly said they need a sustained period of lower uh, interest rates. And given that the underlying inflation rate picked up to 4.1%, Michael, over the June, uh, over June, uh, I think we've got a long, long way to go before uh, we even would be considering lower interest rates from the Reserve Bank's perspective. I'm not sure what, you know, obviously there must be other agendas of those that are predicting that, particularly from the banks. I'm not sure why they're not reading into what's clearly a logical position from the Reserve Bank, uh, but they're continuing to spruik the possibility of lower rates this year, where there's just absolutely no justification for that at the moment. Now, that was a long-winded inflation answer, but you asked me about employment. And uh, of course, the other brief for the uh, Reserve Bank is to maintain as close to full employment as they can. And I would suggest we're still basically at full employment, given a record participation rate, a still very low unemployment rate. I think that the 3% unemployment rates were a real concern for the Reserve Bank, Michael, because it did mean, as I said, without productivity growth, that that would be upward pressure on wages. And um, that, of course, works its way into higher prices, which, of course, works its way, particularly for goods, into, uh, sorry, for services, uh, into, um, you know, higher inflation and therefore, you know, uh, issues with um, with higher interest rates. So uh, I think that the Reserve Bank would be pretty happy with... Um, Certainly the uh, the labour market at the moment, uh, still not happy about inflation. And I think that uh, what that is, it certainly means, as we've uh, discussed here, that the outlook is for steady rates for the remainder of the year. But we will await with bated breath the inflation data, which will come out in uh, a couple of months. And um, But at the moment, certainly, we can't really be criticising this labour market data, Michael. Well... We spoke about the bank's forecasts in the past and they've been, well, far from accurate, but there's only one last man standing now. The Commonwealth Bank still believes interest rates will fall in November. Uh, ANZ believes in the first rate fall will be in February next year, Na National Australia Bank in May next year, and Westpac is reassessing its forecasts. But getting back to the labour figures, if we could just have a look at your chart here, it actually shows that clearly unemployment rates are different in different states. Yes. It doesn't surprise me that Victoria's unemployment rate is yes. the highest, considering what we've spoken about in previous shows about their economy. Yes, Michael, and I think that, um, you know, it does equate to relative performance differentials in housing markets. Uh, we know the Melbourne market has been an underperformer. It's been growing, but certainly not at the rates we've seen some of the other capital city markets. Um, some issues there regarding the local economy. We know that it's been an underperformer as well. And we can see there that it has the highest unemployment rate of, uh, of, the, major, of the major states, Victoria at 4.5%. And, you know, at the other end, no surprise that the Western Australia 
uh, Western Australian economy is still the strongest, uh, certainly in, in terms of major capital city unemployment rates. Its unemployment rate is still in the threes, Michael, 3.7% in Western Australia. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess that's part of the reason we're seeing that. Uh, and it is part of the, the reason we're seeing that booming Perth housing market at the moment. There are other factors such as affordability advantages, um, but also I think that, you know, one of the issues Victoria has always is uh, it, it is a high migration state. Melbourne is a high migration city. Um, so, again, you know, part of the uh, higher unemployment rate could be that, um, you know, it's got to absorb more migrants into its economy. Um, but still at 4.5 percent, you know, Michael, it's uh, it's more what it represents in a relative sense rather than an absolute sense, because that's still quite an acceptable unemployment rate uh, uh, in Victoria. But no doubt, again, underperformance uh, as it has been in its housing market. But uh, there are other factors involved, not just uh, the economy, Michael. Now, one of the figures I like uh, keeping a track of is home loan approvals because they are a leading indicator telling us what's ahead for our housing market because in general people get their home loans approved prior to going ahead and uh, looking for a property what did the latest home loan figure show andrew well, we had a bit of a surprising dip the previous month michael uh, over may uh, because we'd had a strong you know upward trend this year which is no surprise in home lending um, you know, because we've seen strong growth in overall strong growth in housing market activity measured by prices. Uh, and of course, our auction markets have also been robust uh, this year generally. Um, but it bounced back, the market bounced back in terms of home loans, uh, seasonally adjusted home loans over June were up by 1.2%. Uh, so once again, sort of validating that, um, you know, people are borrowing because people are buying. Um, but look, the, the uh, ABS has been upfront about some issues that it's had with uh, its home loan data. So I think perhaps there's some seasonal adjustment issues there, particularly that over that previous month. But nonetheless, um, home loans are now tracking well ahead of where they were a year ago, Michael. And when we look at the breakdown in terms of buyer types, um, investors again sort of led the charge over June. We've seen a big rise in investor activity in terms of loans to investors, home loans to investors this year. Um, and it has been the strongest buyer group uh, quite clearly over the uh, over the over this year to date and uh, over the full year. In fact, um, investor loans are up 3.2% over the month. First home buyers ticked up slightly. They are up 1.8%. There's plenty of incentive for first home buyers to get into the market, Michael, as we know high rents, um, high prices generally, and uh, higher house prices mean that it's, uh, well, firstly, higher rents and higher prices generally means it's tougher to save for the deposit for the first home buyer. Uh, and of course, they need to borrow more with prices rising generally. So um, uh, plenty of incentive for first home buyers. And look, a number of the states now have some quite interesting um, incentives for first home buyers. I think one of the, the ones that uh, in Victoria is the, the state where we see the highest number of first home buyers, first home buyer activity. And it does have, the government does have a shared equity scheme for first home buyers, which I think has proven to be quite successful, Michael, and it, it continues to push first home buyers into the market. And of course, generally they have an affordability advantage as well with prices lower in Melbourne than the other capitals, but not, not as significant as the overall price differences. But when we look at the breakdown in the annual data, Michael, uh, big numbers for investors over the year so far, that's the first six months of this year, investor activity is up by 28.9%. And of course, no surprise there with higher rents and higher prices encouraging investment uh, investor activity, which of course is good news for an undersupplied rental market. If we get more rental properties into the equation, we'll put downward pressure on rents. Um, and over the full year, that's the financial year ending 2024 versus last financial year, investor activity is up by 17.4%, Michael. So these are very big numbers, um, which are validating, you know, the uh, the strength in demand for in, from investors into the housing market. Um, and as I said, this is a good thing because it's going to help rebalance, uh, hopefully, um, the supply of rental properties versus demand. 
uh, which has been a, a, a real issue. And uh, I'm sure governments are, uh, are starting to feel marginally a little bit more comfortable about the outcomes. And we have seen just a slight easing in vacancy rates and rental growth, uh, but whether that's a seasonal impact uh, remains to be seen. But um, uh, and again, interesting that when we look at the um, uh, when we look at the comparisons uh, for the state uh, performances uh, over the month, Western and the year to date, Western Australia quite clearly ahead with um, uh, ahead on those uh, measures and. Uh, when we look at the breakdowns, uh, also with um, uh, with uh, the buyer types, that investors are very active in that Western Australian market uh, over the year so far. Sixty five percent increase in investor lending in Western Australia compared to um, the same uh, six month period at the beginning of last year. But investors are quite strong across the board and um, Victoria is the underperformer there, but investor activity up just by 10%. But the, all the other states uh, are have showing a significant increase in investor lending compared to overall owner occupier, Michael. I just wanted to remind you that this is not specific investment advice because we don't know your personal circumstances, but we're more than happy to have a chat to help you take advantage of the opportunities the current property markets are offering. So why not have an obligation-free chat with one of the wealth strategists at Metropole to discuss your goals, your options, and what you could do. We're much more than just another buyer's agent. We help you safely create intergenerational wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Remember, property investment's a process, not an event. So you can't just go out and buy any property and hope to be successful. In fact, now more than ever, getting the right advice is critical. So if you're looking to invest in property or buy a home, go to metropole.com.au and organize a time for an obligation-free chat you're going to find that at Metropole, we're big enough to tip the scales in your favour, but still small enough to care. And since we don't have any properties to sell, our advice is independent and unbiased. Well, with more people getting loans, it suggests that our spring selling season is going to be a strong one. And one of the things we keep a track of every week is the auction markets, because that's a better in-time indication. We're almost in the spring season yep. now, Andrew. How are the auction markets going? Well, we're certainly showing those early signs of the spring market, Michael, which we do see this time of the year. Maybe it's come a little earlier this year. So, you know, you're suggesting that it could be a a bumper spring market um, is reflecting the uh, the activity we're seeing on weekends, particularly over the last couple of weekends. But we know it's been actually a strong winter market, Michael, with uh, auction numbers and sales uh, higher than, you know, than we typically see. Uh, over winter, so still some heat in the uh, in our in our auction markets, our weekend auction markets. Uh, we don't have the same uh, price energy um, in the market, even though we will continue to see, I believe, uh, strong sales activity. Um, we've seen a lot of the uh, the catch up in the market from higher prices uh, dissipate. Although you know the big three, which we call them, which is Adelaide. Brisbane and Perth are still recording very strong prices, growth a little bit less so in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, but as I said, that's understandable given we're reaching the peak of the affordability cycles, particularly in Sydney. But last weekend, again, uh, it was, I guess we could call it a steady market in the sense that it's still giving us those robust results for this time of the year. Um, but overall, uh, sales activity was, was higher. So I guess it wasn't steady in terms of the... Uh, auction numbers and sales activity, but it's steady in terms of its um, uh, it, it being a, a preview of a of the spring season. So certainly we're well and truly on the on the on the turn on the march into spring. Um, and last weekend's results showed us a big rise in auction numbers in Sydney, Michael. Eight hundred and nine auctions were conducted uh, in Sydney last weekend, which was a big a jump from the previous weekend. Six eighty six. Clearance rates were also up strongly in Sydney, 7 no, 71.9%, 67.1% the previous year. Still not at the level we saw a year ago when the market was um, uh, engaged in that revival with uh, affordability uh, marching higher and therefore prices following. Um, but uh, auction numbers were, uh, again, considerably higher last weekend in Sydney compared to the same 
weekend last year, Michael. Andrew, that's a bit of a bounce back for the Sydney yes. auction market because the last couple of weekends, yes. uh, the, the clearance rates seem to slow, yet higher numbers of properties up for auction and people out there bidding. So there's some depth in the market after all. Yeah, I think it was that the sort of the winter market, a, a, a two weekend winter market in Sydney, you know, and uh, and that's clearly behind it now, and um, a, a very big result for that Sydney market, Michael, uh, surge in, in not only listings, you would have expected perhaps that to put downward pressure on the clearance rate. It, it was the reverse, so we had a big number of sales overall when we put those clearance rates and the uh, and the listings together, Michael, and um, as I said, a very good precursor. For that, um, for the Sydney market, uh, um, at from last weekend's results. So Melbourne steady as she goes, really. Uh, its results again lower than a year ago. Uh, higher listings, but lower clearance rate. But um, we were in a different part of the cycle. Uh, but I think that's that's quite a, a, a again a heady result for Melbourne in terms of uh, uh, the spring market. Big rise in Brisbane auction numbers, Michael, uh, and a higher clearance rate as well. So. Um, Brisbane doesn't typically have a strong a spring market compared to the previous winter market um, as uh, Melbourne and Sydney, but certainly a good result there for what is still a very strong Brisbane housing market and uh, well ahead listing numbers in Brisbane compared to a year ago. Um, but again, its clearance rate was lower, as I mentioned with the other capitals. That was a, a stronger period of the cycle uh, in that reviving market last year. Uh, Adelaide, similar result to uh, the weekend before. Clearance rates down a little bit in Adelaide after its first 80% result in some time, but nonetheless, clearly still a seller's market. And that Canberra market, uh, a similar to Sydney, listing numbers surging, but another 60% plus clearance rate in Canberra, Michael, and we have been uh, previewing the potential of a, a revival in that Canberra market over over recent months, and it looks like perhaps now it's starting to consolidate. When we look at the long-term trends, um, Sydney market dragged down by those two previous weekends. Uh, clearance rates still just under 70%, but I would expect that to improve in coming weekends. Um, Melbourne's actually clearance rate is the strongest uh, it's been for nearly six months. So still a, a solid market, that uh, Melbourne market. And as we discuss, it's mainly a market driven by buyers in the budget and um, uh, mid-price ranges rather than prestige market, which continues to be uh, an underperformer in Melbourne. Um, uh, uh, Brisbane clearance rates, um, certainly on uh, strong results there in a relative sense for Brisbane. Um, anything above 50% is typically a seller's market in Brisbane. Um, Adelaide uh, picking up over what was a quieter July for the Adelaide market um, and still Australia's strongest market in terms of a clearance rate. And as we mentioned, uh, we're really starting to see a uh, perhaps a consolidated revival in that Canberra market. And uh, as we always mention, we can you can get those um, Capital City snapshots 6:30 p.m. of a Saturday uh, on my LinkedIn site, Doc Andrew Wilson at LinkedIn, and Michael publishes the full national report on Sundays, which is also available on my LinkedIn site. And um, if for those that missed it, there's a, a QR code for a link to that PDF file that um, that Michael publishes. So uh, interesting, we're really, it's we've sort of moved very quickly from winter to talking about the end of the year now, Michael, which is gets people up and about thinking about what they're going to do, get their new home, sell their existing home before Christmas, before the holiday break. Um, and that, of course, is the genesis of the spring selling season. But it's always upon us because, you know, these higher numbers are of auctions, um, these are people who've made a decision a good month ago, really, Michael, to put their properties on the market. Yes. So it does start quite early, that spring selling season. And when we do see higher numbers and, um, you know, higher numbers of sales and listings, it acts as it gathers, it gives the market momentum and others that start thinking about, yeah, maybe it's a good time to get into the market uh, and think about a changeover before the end of the year. Well, the property bears seem to have hibernated, gone back to their caves. The pessimists are keeping very quiet on the internet at the moment. All this suggests that our housing markets are going to finish the year better than they started. Having said that, not the strong growth we experienced last year or boy after that post-COVID boom, but this is a, a more mature, balanced market, which is much easier to uh, work through. 
Yeah, and, and that's because the interest rate uh, disruptions are fading, Michael, and that's what causes the wave. You know, we've had uh, in May 22, we had the first interest rate increases for two for, for 10 years, and we've had a number of interest rate increases that, of course, created uh, trepidation in the market. Um, and we had a down year in 2022, but uh, as the clouds cleared, we saw buyers heading back into the marketplace, attracted by affordability advantage or, or affordability uh, positives because prices were lower. And uh, this year we've seen sellers moving back into the market. And, uh, uh, you know, as prices rise, the capacity to borrow um, diminishes and there's nothing happening with interest rates. So uh, that remains a stable force. So really, at the end of the day, as we always say, stable interest rates are the best news for the housing market. Uh, it means more predictability and certainty going forward. And yes, Michael, again, our national market will uh, probably average uh, will, over the past two years, um, given a 10% rise last year and, and probably around about a, an 8% rise this year overall, will pr probably be an above average result over the past two years. So um uh, once again, robust and resilient. That's the mantra for Australia's housing markets, and they continue to prove that. But as I said, the interest rate uh, energy is dissipating now, so we can um, we can sort of move on with those buying and selling decisions without concerns for changes in interest rates and without having to adjust to the cycle, which is now flattening. So um, I think that's good news, Michael. I think it is too. I look forward to catching up with some more good news when we catch up next week. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Michael.